Keeping with the theme of truth and lies, Persona 4 does the most of any Persona game to intentionally lay red herrings the player's way. Red herrings that many players might not notice the care or detail for, and that many new players at this point have already gone in being spoiled on the crucial primary antagonist. Still, I want to point out how interesting I find it that there is essentially a red herring of every type in this game. From characters that are meant to tempt the player's theory, to characters that are set to confuse only the characters. This interesting take on diversifying the meta in how red herrings are presented is worth talking about because it's fun, and it also offers me a good avenue to speak about who they end up being. The first red herring is Morooka, or your initial ugly teacher. Many people probably didn't even consider them a possibility in the situation, but from the offset, he acts antagonistically to you, putting pressure on your freedom as a student as well as insulting you blatantly. You learn from other students that this is his usual routine and that he is a long-standing teacher known for this sort of unlucky behavior if you happen to end up in his classroom. So they give you a reason to believe he wouldn't be the killer as well. This is unfortunate, but the main reason he's a red herring is because there's a long built-up history in Japan, and kind of in all media across all cultures, that bad guys, antagonists, or people meant to not be rooted for are often portrayed as overly ugly, fat, or otherwise unappealing in sharp contrast with the primary cast. In Persona 4's favor, they actually use this trope deliberately for people who end up not being the antagonist. So, the game is actually using this trope in a positive light somewhat by subverting it. Morooka is revealed to just be a hard-coming-down, old-fashioned, out-of-touch teacher, and aside from that, a kind of silly, but generally well-meaning person. After his death, a few students, as well as Yosuke, both voiced that they suspected at one point Morooka might have been connected to the murders, but that now they feel bad in judging him so harshly, in retrospect. I guess they didn't feel too bad, though, because people still slip up and end up calling him King Moron after the fact. An intentionally ridiculous red herring, not to the player, but to the characters, is the idol photographer Creep, attempting to peep in on Risei's bedroom and take pictures before being taken in by Adachi. He's an overweight otaku stereotype, and doesn't even have a proper portrait or name given. This is clearly played for laughs in the game, but can be frustrating for a player who sees this diversion coming. During this scene, you can actually see the real kidnapper move by, but I already mentioned that in my Living World segment, so I'll refrain from going off course here too much. I do think this is most supposedly supposed to be a jab at country life, and the fact that the otaku archetype would much more rarely exist, at least in this radical form, out in the small town of Inaba. We can see proof of this as well by the otaku Risei fan who goes to Yasugami, who again is presented as overweight, but otherwise fairly usual. It's sort of like Chie and Yukiko, both considering their background and knowledge, would have a higher likelihood to see a weird creep seemingly doing something illegal, right near who they presume is going to be the next victim, and draw a silly conclusion. Still, it is one of the dumbest moments for the investigation team, as Chie harps on about the case being solved. The player character dissonance couldn't be greater, but on a meta writing level, there's actually a good function for this to exist in the story, and be placed in the story where exactly it is. It's sort of telling the player in a light and harmless way early on that the investigation team is prone to being wrong, and not just in small details or mistakes. Instead, it's telling you right now that they can be confusingly brought to completely incorrect conclusions. This is important because it happens the dungeon before Mitsuo Kubo's dungeon. Persona games have a long history of telling you something is the final fight, but then having two or three dungeons afterwards. I mean, in Persona 5, the Phantom Thieves build up the sixth palace as their final one, despite the original game having eight and Royal having nine. So I think that this tells the player early ahead of time that the game ending due to bad deduction or the investigation team getting things drastically wrong is on the table which also coincides with the theme of truth and lies, and adapting to the information you're given in situations to continue understanding reality until you get to the actual truth. The next red herring, as I mentioned, and the first substantial one, is the person who genuinely killed Morooka, but is not the true culprit. That is Mitsuo Kubo, who we get a lot of twisted insight into, and that actually serves to challenge the mentality of the investigation team thematically in a bit different of an angle than we're used to. 
Mitsuo wanted to be the hero, the ladies' man, important, famous. Mitsuo was dissatisfied with country life too, working a gross part-time job and feeling disillusioned with the denied advances of future life prospects. Mitsuo was the hero of his own story, and the victim. In a way, this is meant to bargain with the intent of the player, and ask for reflection. While few people playing Persona 4 would likely be similar to Mitsuo, or at least I hope, many players of Persona 4 likely did enjoy the idea of Persona 4 as a conceptual hero fantasy. Where most of the notable girls in the game have a passing crush or are head over heels for you. Where you alone lead a massive group of people as the de facto strongest person, saving the world in the afternoons, and going on beach trips, meeting celebrities, and having ties to the most important things in town during your off days. You are important. You are valuable in Persona 4 as the protagonist. You have everything you could want, and you get to be the good guy. A hero that not only can have it all, but can still do so with virtue. Don't you wish that you were that popular in school, so attractive and likable, that unobtainable people like the prettiest girl in school who is so popularly unattainable that they have a challenge made around asking her out? Then a famous idol comes to town and almost immediately is openly flirting with you and glomping onto your arm? You don't have to be seen as a pretty boy though, because even the gangs of the town look to you for support. At least, that's how it would look from the outside looking in with Kanji. You are someone who brings everyone together, with cherished establishments and hated newcomers, like the Amagi Inn and Juness being friends by your side. Of course, this isn't actually an accurate assessment of Persona 4. It's incredibly shallow and misses the point. Not everyone buys into your hype, first of all, even if flanderization of the Persona 4 cast through anime adaptations and spin-offs may lean into that idea otherwise. Of course, what I said isn't totally accurate, but isn't that some of the selling point of Persona? To some people, at least? And of course, that's not a problem. I mean, unless you end up expecting that too much and are disappointed by the lack of wish fulfillment and instead the actual depth of the game that it provides. Mitsuo, though, is that person. His boss and level are based on the game 3D Dot Game Heroes, which is based itself over JRPGs like Dragon Quest and of other classic adventure games like The Legend of Zelda and Final Fantasy. Also, as a side note, this game is where Scott the Waz's ending theme comes from. Eliminates your need for showers? The inclusion of 3D Dot Game Heroes, though, functions one, as a reference because it's also an Atlas published game, but two, as a way of intentionally memifying, and I mean that in the scientific sense, the idea of the hero fantasy and RPG, which, by necessity of your characters moving through it, draws attention to the characters existing outside of this fantasy as themselves. It's a bit tongue in cheek, but contributes to that valid pressure on the point. Do you really uphold the values of truth that the characters hold? Or are you just escaping into the game as a power fantasy, with no respect to taking these lessons to heart and improving your actual reality? Persona 4 being a game both about seeking the truth at all costs, not avoiding reality or lying to yourself, and a game somewhat about wish fulfillment, are in thematic conflict. So then this arc aims to distinguish and also challenge the player on that aspect should they find themselves in Mitsuo's shoes. Mitsuo is represented in his fight as this freaky embryo psychic baby thing, hiding inside the hero that he plays as. When you destroy his shell of denial, he falls defenseless and immediately attempts to repair himself. When he attacks, he cries out. His way of the world being visually mocked for being childish, self-centered, and attention-seeking. When he loses the fight and falls onto the ground, a last time you see the baby seemingly mumbling something, but instead silently, unable to be heard. Mitsuo doesn't ever properly face himself, and instead feels proud, arrogantly satisfied that you've boughten into his lies, still feeling that he's gotten the fame and attention he wanted, even lying about crimes. But when he gets out, he is blatantly confused as to what the TV world was and what happened. It turns out from the clues in the dungeon, Adachi actually used this disposition of Mitsuo to throw things off trail. He didn't want the game to end, so when Mitsuo delusionally made a false assertion of being the killer, he saw that as a risk, a way to maybe end Namatame from saving. He couldn't let it be. 
It's interesting to consider, as in many ways, Adachi and Mitsuo are guided by similar mentalities and coping mechanisms. But Adachi never wanted fame alone, he wanted praise, respect, and reverence. He wanted to be the head honcho, respected, and live easily. But I find it surprising he didn't seem to feel empathy toward Mitsuo, even when Mitsuo was more than willing to help and side with the killer, even taking on their responsibility. So then our last red herring, the one that if you get wrong, it shuts you into the bad ending of the game. The only real red herring in many regards, Namatame. Namatame is properly foreshadowed all throughout the game, shown on the TV, linked to the inciting murders, his truck is seen at multiple crucial moments, he's seen all around town at the shopping district in the floodplain mumbling about making things right or regretting and yearning for Mayumi Amano still. But it's also mentioned many times that the murders couldn't have been brought on to him due to an airtight alibi, making it impossible for him to have committed the crimes. Still, that sort of gets overlooked when seemingly Namatame is caught red-handed of kidnapping Nanako, in a similar reported way to how the investigation team members were kidnapped in driving a vehicle they deduced as probable for the attempt. Still, there's not a lot to analyze about Namatame being a red herring that isn't already explicitly covered by the game itself through its main plot beats, as him being a red herring is a core plot point, and how he was set up, aside from what I've already mentioned, has already been covered pretty blatantly by the actual script of the game. This segment, and the video series as a whole, is not merely trying to recount the events as a summary, but extrapolate how those things were done from as many analytical perspectives as I can muster. I'm trying my best not to just fall into summary. So I guess if there was something additionally interesting about Namatame, it is that while the first red herring was a stereotype, the second was intended for just the characters, and the third mimicked a less formed but ultimately similar mindset to Adachi's, Namatame mimics a less formed but similar version of your mindset. Yours being the player, the investigation team. You found that you had these powers, ascertained what you could do about the world, and did your best to try to help people. The difference is that when you faced inconsistencies in your perceived perspective, you realigned with them, reconsidered, and refocused on your path toward truth. But Namatame cast on forward, seeking to satisfy the truth and his own self-righteousness, without ever engaging with the truth dynamically. That's what made the protagonist and investigation team the real saviors, while Namatame became an ignorant scapegoat, or maybe sheep is more proper. The wolf convinced the sheep that another sheep was the wolf in sheep's clothing. A twist on the fable of the sheepdog especially considering that Adachi is a police officer, and would be considered more of a wolf in sheepdog's clothing than a sheep. Convincing the sheep, then, that other sheepdogs have caused the problem, and there are no more sheepdogs left to protect the sheep. The final suspect is, of course, the real culprit of the murders, Adachi, acting with the power bestowed upon him, Ameno Sigiri, by Izanami. I talk about Adachi, Ameno Sigiri, and Izanami all in their full segments, so I'll leave this here. If you want to see high-quality Persona 4 essays all written with context of this huge project analyzing each aspect of the game, please help me spread these videos, like, comment, and subscribe. Helps a ton for a smaller channel like this to get bigger, and financially speaking, your support through PayPal on Twitch or on my Patreon would be a super great assistance to continue this going. This is not nearly as deep on the mythology, Japanese culture, and more as many of the other videos and parts, this segment was a very tip of the iceberg type of video, so please feel free to explore the other videos and share the ones that you end up liking a lot more with others. Thanks, and see you soon.